Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bordeaux Show, an ongoing exploration of the famed region and its wines. I'm Ron Edwards, Master Sommelier and Director of Wine Education here at Winebow. We invite you to place any and all questions or comments into the Q&A. We're not really going to manage the chat window. So even if you think it's something that belongs in the chat, put it in the Q&A. That's the best place to do it. Let me introduce your host, certified Bordeaux educator TJ Griffin. TJ has held many jobs within the wine industry, from hospitality to wholesale. Throughout his career, what he enjoyed the most was learning about wine and then sharing that knowledge with others. As the corporate wine educator for Winebow, he now enjoys that privilege full time. And now here to discuss today's topic, the families of Bordeaux, part five. TJ Griffin. Hey, TJ. Hey, Ron, how are you? I'm great. So are you ready to move over to the left bank today? Yeah, <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah, so we've you know, spent a lot of- most people that's what everybody wants to talk about anybody. Exactly. Uh, yeah. anyway. That's what everybody, you know, it's the first thing you think of when you think of Bordeaux and you start learning about Bordeaux and everything's in the left bank. But uh, we gave we gave the right bank a couple of episodes. We got deep into the right bank. So um, now we're moving across and we're going to talk about. Sorry. Me duck. And as you can see, it says the Medoc part one, because we're gonna split it up into two parts. Um, there's um, not a ton of appellations, way less than we was fine on the right bank, but some of them are extremely important and detailed, and I don't wanna give them short shrift. So a um, couple of confusing things that we need to clear up right away is the Medoc uh, is, has sort of two meanings. Um, the bigger meaning that we're talking about right now is the the, the area, the region, the Medoc. And that is, it's a peninsula uh, made up of lowlands, marsh, and forest between the Atlantic Ocean and the Gironde Estuary, uh, just north of the city of Bordeaux. You go, go north and you're in the Medoc. It's about 62 miles long, um, and it's divided into two sections, the Bas Medoc, the lower Medoc, and the Haut Medoc, the upper Medoc. Um, all the wine growing, all the vineyards are on the eastern edge of the Medoc, away from the ocean. Um, I read that they're never more than about seven miles inland from the Gironde Estuary. That's uh, that makes a lot of sense. Having seen the like the differences in what you can grow in northern Michigan within five miles of Lake Michigan, because it's such a tremendous moderator of the climate mm -hmm. uh, it makes so much sense because it's the same parallel 45th parallel same thing um, but that river plays such an important role in how warmth and coolness affects the land nearby especially when you consider that most of this land is fairly flat so there's not a lot of impetus or impotence for that maritime air but you definitely wouldn't want that roaring um, northern climate Atlantic wind to be hitting your vineyard very hard. So definitely makes sense that they're on the opposite side of the peninsula. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, it's funny to me. I've never been to Michigan at all, never mind Northern Michigan, but the fact that Northern Michigan and Bordeaux are on the same latitude, just they don't seem like the same place to me. <laughs> and it just goes back to just what you were saying, the influence of, of all the, you know, the terroir and the, and the climate and the, uh, the topography, the land, the temperature of the ocean, proximity to the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the 45th parallel is fairly crowded with some, some great regions, isn't it? It is that magic spot where hours of daylight and daily average temperature meet a pretty happy medium um, uh, kind of across the globe. It's it, at least in the northern hemisphere, it's the sweet spot. The southern hemisphere is kind of hard to get to 45th parallel unless you're in southern Chile or Peru or something like that. It's actually uh, almost too far south. Well, it's further south than all of New Zealand, Tasmania, and Australia. So there's just not a lot of land left that far south in, in the southern hemisphere. Well, I, I'm going to misquote him, uh, but it's a great quote. And uh, if he ever watches, please... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mark Davidson, the educator extraordinaire for Wine Australia, 
said something once that stuck with me and said something like a lot of the greatest wines in the world come from the warmer areas of marginal regions. So it's that fine line between, you know, just a little bit too cold, but just enough to ripen and preserve all that goodness and acidity and complexity and everything. Uh, so you were talking about the cold North uh, Atlantic ocean and it is cold. We're, we're pretty far North here. Um, and the land forest, the land forest is uh, a big factor in protecting the Bordeaux region. And I didn't know this until fairly recently. Uh, I thought that this was a, a maritime pine forest. You see that a lot uh, where I'm from up in Massachusetts towards the Cape and stuff like that. Uh, but this is a totally man-made forest. This was built, not built, it was planted in the mid 1800s to, to change the land. It was basically, you know, as we've discussed in past uh, episodes, this was all marsh. And part of the, the reclamation was planting this forest. And I don't think at the time they ever really gave thought to, does this protect the vineyards? Maybe they did, but um, it certainly is a huge factor now. And it's the largest man-made forest in Western Europe. So they use the warehouser trick, huh? Take marginal land, plant a bunch of trees, let it soak up all the water, and all of a sudden you can drive on it, right? Yep. So uh, aside from the beautiful vineyards and the amazing chateau uh, and, you know, the old medieval churches and stuff like that, uh, which, are, which are scattered around, the, the topography is not the most beautiful in the world. It's very flat, as you can see from this photo. Um, there's uh, gentle inclines. When we talk about the right bank, we talked about saint emilion and plateaus, and we talked about Fronsac and getting some elevation. Um, not a ton of elevation over here, just gentle slopes, uh, generally made of gravel, which we'll talk about in a second. I think that's it's a beautiful picture, but it's just not as picturesque as maybe some other wine regions. Maybe not, but that, that castle with the moat there in the foreground is uh, making up for any undulations in the ground. <laughs> Yeah, if you get to live there, I guess. So. I don't know. I don't think I want to live there because that's a no. lot of maintenance. That 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 right there is a hole in the earth to pour your money. But uh, yeah. man, it's beautiful <laughs> to look at. You have to have the money to buy it, and then the money to maintain it, which I'm probably sure the the, the latter is more expensive than the former. There's some sort of reality show that my mom keeps talking about, where this couple bought a a chateau somewhere in France, and they're they're trying to restore it and finding out it's very expensive yeah they they turned it into a party and airbnb spot especially for weddings and uh i've seen a couple of those episodes because it's a big thing my wife found and thought man this is really cool and it is fun to see what it takes for them to renovate this old castle um and uh there are two brits that are that are sort of expatted in, down into uh into France, it's uh, it's it's a it's it's fun if you like renovation shows, which we do. If you don't like renovation shows, it is really going to be rough to watch through that. <laughs> is that what you're going to do someday? Is is buy an old chateau and renovate it? Uh, no, um, <laughs> just but watch. I just do watch like old, I do like old houses, and I really you know there is that dream one day to have enough, as you spoke, right? To have enough money to not only buy a beautiful old home like in downtown Richmond or something, but also have the residual income to keep it up because everything's custom and then, and you want to keep it period and everything, but oh, renovating and living in a house. I've done that. Don't want to do it again. <laughs> a little stressful. So there we have our map and I'm just going to point out what we're going to cover today. So we're going to talk about the Medoc uh, as an appellation. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to skip for now, saint Estef, Poyac, and Saint-Julien. Uh, we're going to talk about Listrac Médoc, uh, Mouly, also known as Mouly en Médoc. We're going to skip over Margot for now, uh, and we're going to cover the Au Médoc. Um, so you can see there's eight appellations in total. Uh, they call them six communal uh, appellations. So you have Médoc and Au Médoc as sort of regional or sub-regional, and then you have the communal um, appellations in the middle. This, uh, as we said at the beginning, this is the most well-known uh, part of Bordeaux for, for wine lovers. And uh, you start learning about the great gross and, and all that stuff, which we'll cover in another episode. We're gonna do, just so everybody knows, we're gonna do a whole episode just about the classifications in Bordeaux. Uh, so that will be coming, so don't worry. 
Uh, but this area, this whole region produces about 100 million bottles of wine, 40% uh, of which is exported. I'm sorry, 60% of which is exported. 40% stays in the EU, but 60% is, is export outside the EU. Um, wines here, Ron, you know this, can rain, you know, go from 5 or $6 a bottle to 5 or $600 a bottle. Yes. Um, so and, it's a um, bit of a range in prices here. Yes, but, you know, it's really intriguing, too, because we think of the area as only the, you know, $50 retail and up option, and it's, it's not entirely true. When you make 100 million bottles to export, they're not all going to be $50 plus a bottle, even though a, a, a notable chunk of it is maybe a higher percentage in Bordeaux than other places um, hit that higher retail level because of its reputation. But, you know, I was just thinking about, okay, 100 million bottles, what could my yearly allocation of that be and be perfectly happy and they would never miss it? I don't know. How many do you think you could get through in a, in a lifetime? I don't know about a lifetime, but, you know, a bottle a day is a pretty normal routine for us sommeliers. So no. some of us by ourselves, I tend to share them. You know, what's interesting here too is um, – we talk about the left bank and right bank. I mean, this really is, you can see almost the entire region is along the Gironde. And just at the bottom, uh, right around the, the bottom of Margot is when it starts to split off into the Garonne, the Dordogne rivers. Um, whereas if you look at the right bank, most of that, especially, you know, we talk about saint Emilion and Pomerol, that's all on the, the Dordogne river. So it's a big difference. And the Gironde estuary is large, very wide. Um, so a significant effect. And as you go up further north, you can see we're, we're getting less and less land. It's, it is a peninsula. It thins out at the end there. So um, that maritime influence will certainly be stronger up there. Uh, I like this picture. This is from one of the websites. <laughs> we talked about this before, too, about um, how the sort of the money perpetuates the money. Um, and the sort the variability and quality of the different websites. Um, the website for Medoc is is very good. And, yeah, uh, I can, I can only imagine. They have some resources available. That is an absolutely stunning picture too. <clears throat> um, back to uh, the prices because you, you made a good point there. Uh, according to the source that I found, the core prices of the wines from the Medoc. Um, is about 10 to 20 euro, which is like 12 to $24. So that's where their sweet spot is. So we, again, we think of, you're right, we think of all the $50, $100 bottles, but that's not really the production. That's only a small part of it. So uh, we talked about the Atlantic Ocean, the Gironde Estuary. Um, the term medoc apparently comes from Latin medio, in medio aque. Uh, meaning uh, in the middle of the water between the two, the Gironde and the Atlantic Ocean. So this uh, this mesoclimate combined with the soils, there's a lot of, uh, there's not much temperature variability here, Ron. It's never super, super hot. It's never super, super cold. It's always in that that middle range. It's, uh, it's generally warm and damp, a lot of rain. Um, it's very, I think, unique in the world of wine. Uh, in that, you know, we always talk about the importance of diurnal temperature drops and, you know, you go to Napa in the summer and it's 100 degrees during the day and 60 at night. And that's true for a lot of regions, but not Bordeaux. Bordeaux is very kind of even tempered, um, but it works for them. And uh, certainly the, the dampness is a problem. Sometimes it can cause rot, it can cause mildew, but it also is the source of noble rot, which produces some of the great sweet wines of the world, as we'll talk about in an upcoming episode. So you get the good with the bad. Mm -hmm. In all difficulties, there are blessings somewhere along the way. And, uh, you know, that one of the reasons we talk about diurnal shift is places that need to be cooled off, right? The, the reason that it works so well in Napa is that it needs to cool off in the evening. Otherwise it would be a disaster area for winemaking. Um, Bordeaux is not like that. It's just one long, even tempered thing. It's very similar to what you get when like as a new world comparison would be Marlboro, New Zealand, never very warm, never very cool. Mm -hmm. Always hovering in that upper sixties, lower seventies and you're not very cold at night and just, you know, sunshine abundant to make it 
up here, you know, uh, it's, it's a little bit warmer than that, you know, but still it's, it's ideal for what they do there. Yeah. And I don't know off the top of my head, the difference in rainfall, but certainly Marlboro's a lot sunnier and, and drier, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's sort of that kind of coolish temperature all year round. I mean, certainly you go to the Bordeaux in the summer and it's warmer, but um, you know, certainly enough to ripen, but that's, that's where we've had vintage problems or vintage variation in the past when it doesn't quite get warm enough to ripen fully the Cabernet stuff, you know, especially um, now with climate change, we're sometimes running into the opposite problem where Merlot is it's getting too hot and Merlot is getting too ripe. But we're also going to talk, uh, just to let everybody know, because I had a question about it during uh, the week, was um, about vintages. And we're going to devote a whole episode just to vintages, too. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, the most recent ones and some of the great ones in the past for both um, for the left bank, the right bank, white wines, sweet wines. So stay tuned for that as well. Awesome. That's just one long list of, wow, I, was that a good one? Oh, man. Oh, was it? Oh, I may have, I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> well, when I, when I first started uh, in sales, you know, the, the joke was, this is every, every year is the vintage. This is the vintage of the century. This is the vintage. Yeah. No, this is the vintage. There was never, they always found a way, the Bordeaux folks that uh, presented to us to present whatever happened in a very positive light. Well, of course, every vintage, <laughs> the, the vintage I have to sell you is a good vintage always because yeah. I have it to sell you. <laughs> you just have to drink it now. Um, but a, a lot a lot less vintage variation over the years, uh, uh, you know, coming in. And also, as we've talked about in other episodes, a lot more knowledge uh, in the vineyard and in the winery. So it's not they're uh, equipped to handle issues a lot more than, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, certainly. So the Medoc, so this is where it gets confusing because Medoc is the whole region, but it's also part of the region, the Appalachians. So this is from their website. I love that they do this. They, they highlight the area uh, that's just the Medoc. So any of the eight Appalachians, can produce an AOC Medoc. You could be in the middle of Poyak and produce an AOC Medoc. Um, you probably don't need to because you can produce AOC Poyak, but for declassified, as you were talking about, Ron, uh, uh, recently in the conversation, you can declassify your wine, uh, maybe in a in a rare, poorer vintage now. You could you would have to do that and, and maybe go to AOC Medoc to protect your, your reputation and your name. But generally, uh, if you see AOC Medoc, it's coming from this area up in the north. Um, and the terroirs up here, we're on the left bank, so we're talking gravel, but it's not all gravel, it's not 100% gravel. So uh, two types of gravel here, Garonne gravel, which is big rocks, well-draining, um, very prized for that. Um, well-draining gets the air in there, some aeration. You also get, uh, the, those are the kinds of rocks that warm up in the sun and retain some heat, so very good for that. Uh, Pyrenean gravel, which comes from the word Pyrenees, I assume. And that is uh, more of a sandy clay gravel, so a little bit of water retention there. And you have some clay and limestone underneath as well. So in general, uh, those are the things you see in the left bank uh, in different proportions. Some are just almost all garon gravel. Uh, some are a mix. Some have some limestone patches. Some have some clay. Uh, oh, some interesting things to talk about this. So, Ron, we have. <laughs> I feel like we 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 have these recurring themes that happen from episode to episode. So, we talked about if you are. Um, Starting now, maybe you were a winemaker at um, Aubryon or whatever, and you want to start your own, where are you going to go? Um, you're, you're limited uh, in terms of, I assume, you know, startup money, startup costs, speaking of buying a chateau. So this is an area that has increased quite a bit uh, in vineyard plantings uh, recently because it was underdeveloped. Um, so you're seeing a... Um, a lot of growth there and a lot of small estates that work together in cooperatives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very powerful cooperative movement that's allowed them to continue to grow and improve since the 50s. Right. 
And all of the winemakers who are either into windsurfing or actual surfing, they need to be further up closer to the coast because it's a long drive from, from Bordeaux city out to the beach. And then it's hard to get back for work and your boss doesn't like you anymore. It's just, you know, so you gotta move a little closer. Yeah. And I don't, I, I, you're probably right. They probably do surf in the Atlantic here, but they also surf in the Gironde. There's, yeah, they, uh, the, there's the tides there. Yeah. yeah they, they surf the tidal bore as it comes in, but yes, the, that strip of coastline is some of the best Atlantic surfing beach break surfing. There is, is it. Yeah. Especially the as thing- you get down to the, where it curves and, and about just before it hits Spain is like super world-class. The thing that I saw with the Giron that looked interesting as someone who windsurfed, I've never surfed, but um, those tidal waves, uh, they just continue. They don't break. They kind of go, go, go. So you can really get a great ride, I would, I would guess. I don't know if you've ever done that before. Miles, kilometers on yeah. one wave if, you're, if you don't fall and your legs don't give out. <laughs> so that sounds like it would be fun. I agree. Totally. You might want to wear a wetsuit, right? Probably pretty cool. Uh, yes, year round. Year round. Water's always cold. It's like Northern California. So the uh, the cooperative movement here, they have a group called the L'Union des Viticultures du Médoc, uh, which is shortened to Unimédoc, which I like, Unimédoc. Um, and they oversee a lot of the cooperative uh, uh, ventures. So here's some numbers, Ron. Uh, the Médoc, and pay attention to the middle number because I found this fascinating. Um, 36 million bottles is the average production just from the AOC Médoc um, 34% of the vineyard, uh, about 440 wine growers, vine growers, um, m- more than half you see are in co-op, co-ops. And this is a screenshot from their website. So um, you don't need to tell me that independent is misspelled. Although it's probably not misspelled in French. So Ron, one of the things that um, I st- you know, we're, we're kind of the last country that works on uh, the old English system of measurements and stuff like that. And when we talk about the wine world, no, it's, it's terrible. It, even it's, in the new world, uh, when they talk about wine, they're talking about, you know, hectares and liters. And, and we sort of understand that 750 milliliters, typical wine bottle size, 375 is a half bottle. So we, we're kind of halfway there. But when we say hectares, what the heck? I don't know what that means. You know, you know, so I, I, yes. What the heck? Are? We, <laughs> what the heck are? So I decided to show a little uh, illustration to, to show you what a hectare is. It's one centimeter. No, wait a minute. That's not, that's, that was the ruler. Okay. So one hectare equals 2.47 acres. And again, uh, I'm kind of, of the, uh, I'm in the world like, well, what's an acre? You know, unless you're a realtor uh, or a farmer, maybe you don't know what an acre is. And I, I kind of had no concept what size an acre was. So I'll show you what an acre is. So here we go. That's a standard American football field. Um, you Thank know, you for if the you clarification. Since we, if it was metric, well, it was I in tried a to, football I, field and have soccer goals on it. I tried to, um, to look up football field hectare comparison and all I got was soccer pitches. So um, I do want to clarify for those who might be um, more on the soccer bent, but this is a American football field. If you've never been on one, you know, you've seen them, you've seen, you know, sometimes they have a track going around them if you're in a high school or college. Um, And that's about an acre. So almost the entire football field, excluding the end zones, which you see on the ends, and about to the nine yard line, uh, so that, and and just as wide. So that's about an acre. So that's a that's a good comparison. I can I can wrap my head around that. And ninety here, yards, ninety yards by fifty five yards, right? Isn't a football field fifty five yards wide? I don't know. I should know that. I think that's about what you're talking about there. And that's a hectare. So really big difference. Acre, hectare. So two almost two and a half times the size. So when we talk about two hectares, you know, as a small vineyard. Yes, it is small, but it's not. It's much bigger than a football field. It would be many football fields. So I hope, I, I found that interesting. I hope it's helpful for people. So when we talk about hectares, because it's, um, I was tempted when I start off in education to always convert 
from the metric to our system. And, and now I have a different mindset. I think we should sort of get on board with uh, the rest of the world here. And so we're all talking the same language, which just be easier. Yeah, and while we're at it, let's just convert fully to the metric system so that we can stop torturing our <laughs> children with dividing by 12 instead of 10 and trying to figure out how yards in a mile, feet in a mile, that's crazy talk. 10, 100, 1,000, it's a beautiful system. We are so crazy as Americans, we're just crazy. I remember, I, I think I told you the story once, I remember learning multiplication in, in the fourth grade and back then there was no common core, you just memorized the tables. And uh, you know, you get up 10, 10 is a relief, you get to 10, it's so easy, right? And then 11 is fairly easy. And then you get to 12 and I sort of had this mindset, I, I give up. When am I ever going to have to learn how to multiply and divide by 12? And that's when I realized as I got in the wine business, that's all we ever do is multiply and divide by 12. So this was another uh, uh, sort of interactive, you can click on this circle and this is what comes up for each of the appellations. I found pretty helpful to see where, where they're at. So. You see these two terms in the beginning, cru artisan and cru bourgeois. Um, those are classification systems that we will discuss uh, later on in another episode, but 76 other growths and then three co-ops for the main group. Cru artisan, is that dictated by size of the winery by chance? No, it's, it's, it's sort of, I remember learning about it. I actually had never heard about it until I went to L'Ecole um, a couple of years ago to get the certification. And it's a, it's a relatively new, um, it's, it's a little bit, I want to say this without being pejorative. It's a little fanciful the way it um, talks is about it, it. Is it an attempt to requalify what was once called Petit Chateau? I believe, yeah, there was some... Um, that's one of the goals. And uh, I'm not saying it's not mean? a good, I'm, I don't want to, you know, bombarded with uh, calls from the Lecole, like, what are you doing? Um, mm -hmm. That it's not a legit uh, classification. It's just sometimes there's these layers of classifications that I'm not sure if there was really a need for, um, uh, but they felt there was. So we'll yeah. discuss that when we get to the um, classifications. A lot of classifications on the left bank here that we have to think about. It's nothing personal. It's just separation of the classes. Yes. <laughs> so now we're in the upper Medoc as we go paradoxically south. Um, but I believe it's a, it's more of an elevation thing. So the Ba Medoc to the O Medoc. And you can see um, this whole, it's a big area that it covers, but it's only certain zones. So you can see what's sort of, I won't say, I can't say whited out because it's not whited out or blacked out, it's pinked out. Um, those are not allowed to produce so many duck. But anywhere else in that sort of magenta dark pink is considered a uh, fair game for Ome duck wines. Um, this was, uh, this division between the Meduc and the Ome duck was in 1935, so quite a, quite a long time ago. Um, mostly here we're in most of the Garonne gravel uh, within the Ome Duck, here's where you have um, those uh, amazing um, chateaus that we talk about. Um, but again, this this is the area, uh, only these zones within it. So it's not like AOC May Duck, where you can be, um, or it's not like the region May Duck, where you can be anything uh, um, and still be labeled AOC May Duck. But um, this is only certain regions that Ome Duck. So I imagine it was at, at one point delineated by some sort of elevation. So there's our production. And this is what I found fascinating, less production, bigger seeming area, less production than, um, than the Meduc. Meduc is very concentrated uh, with vineyard. It has more vineyards and more production in a smaller area. Yeah, their yields are a little bit higher too then a ton of the growers here in the Omidoc are cutting yields a little lower. Yeah. But what's also interesting is if you look at, the, if you do the division between the previous slide and this slide, I think you'll see that the 301 wine growers on average make more wine per grower. I didn't do it completely, but that's mm. just my instinct here is that 139 less growers are making a bit more wine per grower because yep. the, the concerns are just larger. 
Yep, they are. Um, we talked about the Maydock being a lot of small growers. This is um, probably, this is the area where you have the largest growers on the left bank, um, the largest vineyard holders. And one thing to talk about, Ron, as we go, you can see where the city of Bordeaux is there at the bottom. Some vineyards that existed in the beginning of the 20th century are no longer there because of urban sprawl, which is a shame, but um, it happens, you know, cities have to grow. Yep, just ask Argentina. Or, no, I'm sorry, ask Chile. Santiago is like Santiago. over the world, yeah. <laughs> the Cusinia Macul vineyard right in the middle of the city. Um, so here we see something that we haven't seen and we're not going to see on any of the other slides. So we break this up. Five, Cru Classé. So that is the, the great growth, as we're talking about. Uh, premier, um, deuxième, troisième, quatrième, cinquième. Oh, my French is a little rough today, but um, that's uh, only here in the Homme Doc. And you still see we have the others with the Cru Bourgeois, the Cru Artisan, the Co-ops. So it's all here. Listrac Medoc doesn't get the attention that um, some of the others get. It's a, you hear about Medoc, Homme Medoc, and of course you hear about saint Estaf and Saint-Julien and um, Poyac and Margot. You hear about Listrac Medoc, but it, it's sort of... Um, this and its uh, sibling, the Mouli, are a little could use a little bit of love, and they're making some great wine. It was a it was a very famous commune at one point, and came back into favor at the beginning of the the twentieth century. Um, yeah, it, it was the like laugh. It, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it looks like it's planted on a mountain, of the roof of the Medoc at forty three meters of elevation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Marketing imagery yeah, so is amazing. Uh, a lot of this, uh, you know, this information comes right from their website, and I some sometimes it's a little flowery language, um, and I usually change it to more uh, everyday, more concise language. But I, I had to leave that the roof of the Midoc rising proudly to forty three meters. So you see this hill, forty three meters. And you're like that is a proud hill. Um, I would I would say that it definitely probably has a positive effect in the spring where it sheds, oh, absolutely. sheds frost to the other areas around it and um, it, it's probably a little drier because the water's draining out faster and it it definitely has a reason to be there but it is it is a a beautiful a piece of uh, of uh, marketing speak there I love it <laughs> that's what they're good at. Yeah, I mean, uh, we went to visit a vineyard um, when I was there, and they had just had some recently some frost, and it was only it was just a part of a dip in the vineyard. It maybe was less than two meters uh, of difference, and that's all it took for the frost to um, to damage kill their vines. So yes, every foot counts here. Every meter counts, I should say. Not we're not talking feet anymore. Um, so here you have the gravelly outcrops that we talked about. Uh, the, Croup, um, those are all, almost always planted with uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which likes its uh, well-drained gravelly soils. And then you have Merlot, more on the limestone plateau. And here, 5% uh, of the vineyard, so uh, a lot less production. We jumped way, way down, only a little over 50 wine growers. Ron, is it just me or did one of them say vine grower? And this one says wine grower. I admittedly was not looking that close, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I didn't they, catch that when I was putting they, this together. In Europe, they tend to say, tend to use the term vine grower. I love the term wine grower and wine growing. I, I use it all the time now because it's it's a thing. It's definitely, mm -hmm. it's, um, and it if, is and what if you're people are doing for the most part. Yeah, and if you're German, that's what you'd say anyway. My My wines, my wine grower because that's how they pronounce the V when they translate it. Uh, Paul Krieger chipped in, said he was paying attention, and it was the Medoc said vine grower. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I know I wasn't crazy there, because I was looking at it, I'm like, did they just say wine grower, and they said vine grower earlier? So um, still some work for the webmaster to do in the uh, Medoc website, although it is a beautiful website. So here, only one Cru Artisan, 12 other gross, some Cru Bourgeois, and one Co-op. So just a much smaller area, but um, some great terroirs here, Ron. Did you ever work with uh, specifically working with Lee Struck uh, Medoc wines when you were um, in the biz? When, 
when yes, I would use their um, classified growth selections between that and the Omidoc to have wines on a menu that for a reasonable price restaurant and still have elevated status wines. I would use wines from there for sure. I've, I've always liked the wines from that area. I I don't, from what I found in my studies, it's not like the production's increasing because there's really, it's, it's a small area and it's, it's all planted, but the reputation is increasing uh, as their quality grows. So you should see more and more of that on the market. And I would assume some still some really good values if you're looking for that left bank style at a lower price. Mouli en Médoc, uh, also it is acceptable, Ron, to just say Mouli. Um, either one is acceptable under the law. You don't want to break the law, um, but under the AMC rules. And Mouli is, um, I wish Sonia was here, but uh, Moulin, I believe, is a mill, windmill, uh, the Moulin Rouge. Uh, and Mouli supposedly takes its name from that. It's some sort of derivative of windmill uh, from the, the windmills on its higher land, taking advantage of that, uh, that uh, breeze coming off the ocean. Um, this was another area that was very well known, very respected back in the day, and then sort of just got surpassed by its siblings. Um, probably some due to better to warm, probably some due to marketing and being in the right place at the right time. Um, one Bordeaux writer says this, the Mouly appellation is a terrific concentration of the Medoc vineyard. So I don't know exactly what they meant with that, but to me that says, this is, if you want to know what the Medoc is, this is the Medoc, get the wines from here. Um, what, what do you think that they're trying to say there? Um, I, that makes sense to me. It also would make sense to me that maybe it's a combination of all the terroir of the Medoc squeezed into one little place. Yeah, that could be maybe, it too. Yeah, maybe it's the, it could be the stylistic range of expectation is all in one place. I don't know. That's a good question. Obviously, he did. The writer did their job by making us still want to think about <laughs> that then, uh, unless the intent was to be clear, in which case we're still a little fuzzy. Yes. Um, so there's no classified gross here, but there are um, plenty of cru bourgeois. Some of the Chateau Chasselin is a wine that I've heard of and had. Actually, it's here. Um, and this is uh, right between the main roads leading into Medoc, so just far enough so it's not a bother, but very easily accessed. So a good spot there. So a little bigger um, than its uh, twin appellation, well, not twin, but sibling appellation, Listrak, but still very, very small. And we see the one Cru Artisan, 17 Cru Bourgeois, and 21 other growths. And that is our little tour of half of the Appalachians on the left bank. If you would like to check out the website, the Medoc Bordeaux website is, is quite good. Lots of information, lots of uh, graphics and interactive stuff. Mouly, I checked out, I think it's only in French right now, or was it under construction? One of those two, or both. It was in, only in French and under construction. And of course, the main website, as I always say, every episode, Bordeaux.com, fantastic uh, resource for all things Bordeaux. And and it's time for questions. Yes. So if you have questions, Randy, Paul, Mario, Mark, Laura, Ken, <laughs> Kathleen, or John, or any of the others that are out there, uh, that was a great time to put them in the Q&A while we talk about what's coming next on May 25th. So now we're going to talk about, uh, in that episode, um, Margot, uh, saint Estephe, Saint-Julien, and Poyac. Uh, what, what I think was the first things I learned about when I learned about Bordeaux, because that's what uh, got all the press. Still gets most of the lion's share of attention from, from people, and that's where the, the great houses, the great chateaus are located. So, But they're very distinct, and they're probably some of the most studied wine regions in the world. So there's a lot to talk about those. So I want to dive deep into those and we'll probably spend a little less time talking about um, numbers like hectares and, and production uh, and really talk about the terroirs. I think that's really important and the styles of wine that each commune is known for. 
I like that. I think that's a great plan. And uh, we do have, this is sort of a comment slash question. So are you ready, TJ? All right. Ken wants, it kind of starts off with normally the further you move away from the coast, the warmer the summer heat. In other words, you don't have that maritime cooling influence, right? Since Cab requires warmer weather than Merlot, I assume Cab does better in the Medoc is because of the length of the season, question mark. And your response is? So saying that it does better in the left bank because, um, is it saying why? Because it's paradoxically should do better on the right bank because it's farther away from the ocean? Um, perhaps he's kind of drawing the conclusion that because the Medoc is further inland, the, um, that the summer heat is helping it out. Um, I think there are other factors. I don't think it's quite that simple because the area is fairly consistently themed temperature wise, but I wanted you to jump in there and, and, and in other words, why does Cabernet do so well on the left bank and yeah. not so much on the right bank, I think is where he's heading. And weather is only one, I think it's a smaller factor than the real important factors, but hit, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, I totally agree with you. Um, there's a lot of other factors, but the weather is, I mean, uh, we, you want, I think you want um, Cabernet to be a little on on the cooler side because, um, you know, a lot of the, I think of Cabernet is one of the most nuanced grapes that uh, you can produce. So right up there with with Riesling, with, with Pinot Noir, you know, et cetera. And uh, when you see if you've had, Cabernet from really warm areas. They're not that nuanced. They can be delicious, but they miss out on all that complexity. So going back to that Mark Davidson quote, the warmer areas of marginal climates, I think um, it's beneficial to maybe keep uh, Cab a little cooler. But I think the more important reason that you see more Cab on the left bank is it likes that free draining gravel a lot. And if you look on the right bank, um, again, we've discussed this in many episodes that it's not you know, you can't say 100%. Whenever you see clay, that's going to be Merlot. Whenever you see limestone, that's going to be Cabernet Franc or Merlot. Whenever you see gravel, that's going to be Cabernet. It's not 100% like that because the soils aren't that homogeneous. But in general, Cabernet Sauvignon likes those those really free-draining gravelly soils. And Merlot likes to have a little bit of, of clay and warmth and, uh, and tr thrives better. And that was studied over centuries and centuries and centuries so that it wasn't um they had time to play around with it i don't think as much scrutiny um as we see in in certainly in burgundy but there were monasteries here that kept those we've talked about that in past episodes that kept those really detailed records that without those records to see what were they doing 75 years ago what were they doing 120 years ago uh, oh that didn't work okay so we'll move that over here um Bordeaux, Burgundy, parts of Germany. I'm trying to think of where else really had that level of record keeping. Not too many places. And uh, so that's why you see the really delineated uh, vineyards and in and, and certain regions, what grape is planted where, and that's Bordeaux. What was your response, Ron? Uh, I, I was going to go down that path of like the weather, yes, matters, but the the gravel soils are, are a huge issue. And, and remember that before phylloxera, devastated the region, the area was planted to a whole lot more different varieties and the major grape was Merlot <clears> on the <throat> left bank. So they transferred to Cabernet later um, because they found it working very well. And Ken then alluded to the concept of, or asked the question and sort of as a statement, the right bank warms up later in spring and is cooler earlier in the fall. So yes, it's a little easier to get Merlot ripe when you don't have heat. Um, but I think we're looking at varying small degrees of change uh, compared to how different the grape vines that we're talking about act in the different soil types. Uh, if you put Cabernet Sauvignon in heavy clay soils, it just doesn't like it. It mm. won't produce great wine very well. Uh, but if you put it in that gravel where it doesn't have wet roots all the time, and the, and the other thing is the gravel makes the ground not cold. Clay soils are cold year round, and and Merlot is okay with that, but Cabernet is not so okay with that. Yeah, Cabernet is very finicky. And great point about the different grapes because there were so many grapes planted. Carmenere was huge, and of course the expense and labor of ripping up your vineyards just because you wanted to try a different grape was. Uh, 
was prohibitive. You wouldn't do it. But when you had no choice, that's when people said, okay, we know what works where and what works best. So we're going to try to plant those. And that's when you saw the big uh, shift in what grapes became the dominant grapes. So that's a great point. That seems to be the end of our questions. So it looks like it's time to bid well, them thanks, Ken. Those are great questions and comments. Um, same day, same time every week, as we've talked about, you can join Ron and I, where we switch roles um, and talk about uh, pre-shift, which is uh, more of the hospitality side. And I forget off the top of my head what the topic is, Ron. It's oh, this coming one. this coming week's topic is the very and very important topic of how we wine and knowledge geeks use knowledge wisely in, in our environments, uh, as opposed to ways I've used it in the past, which I'll tell some of the horror stories. <laughs> I'll, also, I'll also give you some encouragement. And so tune into that at 11 this coming Tuesday. Very exciting. Don't use knowledge as a blunt instrument. That's correct. Yes, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's not a bludgeon. As, as I've often told people. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to be a lot of fun. And then we'll wrap up. Uh, we'll not wrap up the entire left bank, but we'll wrap up the Maydoc next uh, in two weeks. So please join us. And until then, stay safe. Um, drink some Bordeaux. Let us know how it was. And uh, we'll see you then. <laughs>